You know, just like how I always mentioned empowered abilities, yet never made a dedicated episode on that until last January, I'm surprised with how frequent my references to super ultimates are, and I haven't made a standalone video for that one either. Now's as good a time as any though. Ultimates in League are the defining ability for the majority of champions, housing most of their power budget. Second only to summoner spells, knowing when your opponent's big guns are reloading can make all the difference between victory or defeat. For some, the significance of their ultimate isn't as consequential, especially for those that don't pertain to immediate combat such as global teleports which I talked about last December. Others may not even have a conventional ultimate like shapeshifters, choosing instead to allocate their power budget into more basic abilities. On the opposite end, we have those with ultimates that when used correctly, have some of the highest devastating immediate impact. The presence of even one of them is enough to influence both teams in how they approach the game. And if you're staring down a team with several, the very threat of their usage can be more intimidating than the actual use of it. That is of course unless your name is Silas, who by all means would love to have as many of these on the enemy team as possible. Today, we're going to discuss what I have unofficially termed Super Ultimates, the most powerful abilities in the game as we know it. But first, a word from our sponsor, Facecheck once again. Facecheck is an overlay program found on Overwolf, which I'm sure most of you have by now, that provides you with a lot of information to make it easier for you to approach each and every game you play. For example, while in Champ Select, it gives you a list of stats for every player on your team. So if you're the type of person to look up every player to see who's autofilled, now you don't have to, because Facecheck gives you a profile of each teammate, and as for yourself, you get to set runes and item builds for whatever champion you plan to play. While in game, it brings up the same rundown of every player on the enemy team, so you can find out which person's on a losing streak or if they have a smurf you have to be careful for. I mentioned this in the past, but one of my favorite things about the app is that it shows you damage spread, how much estimated physical, magic, and true damage to expect so you can itemize accordingly. When the game is done, you get a detailed analysis on your personal performance in comparison to how your lane opponent did and more, just to check out what you were doing poorly at in order to improve. It's a fantastic app that you can easily tag onto your client through Overwolf, so check out the link on screen or in the description if you're interested. Really helps out the channel, but for now, let's get back into the video. As stated earlier, ultimates are generally meant to be a champion's coup de grace. Its high cooldown is offset by the sheer power it can exert on behalf of the wielder to the point where a team vastly behind in gold and levels but has all 5 ults on deck can overpower a notably stronger team with none at their disposal. Ultimates can range from big damage nukes, to powerful buffs, to massive engage tools, to funky little gimmicks. Whatever the case may be, it plays a key part in collecting information and preparing for a fight none the more so than super ultimates. What separates a super ultimate from a regular one is highly subjective. Someone might nominate Viego's Heartbreaker on account of its ability to reset several times with every takedown, or they might choose Lux's Final Spark whose equal combination of range, coverage, and damage make it versatile for a lot of different scenarios. That said, there's usually a noticeable difference between a super ultimate and a regular one. Let me explain. First thing to consider is whether or not it functions well on its own. Most super ultimates were designed to be activated by themselves. They don't exactly synergize with the rest of the champion's kit, at least directly. In this case, Heartbreaker would not qualify as a super ultimate since it's only a threat due to its passive. So an easy way to look at it is, if Silas were to hijack the ability, would it still have the same massive impact, or would its threat level be mitigated? Orianna's Command Shockwave is a classic teamfight ultimate, really good for following up on any engage and setting up wombo combos, but it's heavily contingent on her ability to remotely position the ball from a distance or to attach it to one of her allies. Silas has three dashes to get him smack dab in the middle of the fight, yes, but Shockwave in and of itself requires setup, super ultimates usually don't. Second and most obvious, the combat pressure. It's important to remember that an ability's damage output is predicated on not just its numbers on paper, but the coverage as well. Syndra's Unleash Power carries with it a reputation for being one of the best single target burst abilities in the game. It boasts a fearsome 1330 base damage and 140% ability power scaling at max strength, but it targets only one person, therefore the entire team need not be too afraid of this attack, typically whoever is most vulnerable to it such as a squishy carry. Super ultimates have high damage output that can also be inflicted on the entire enemy team. This is even more pressing if the ability in question comes with hard crowd control, which can expose you to further pressure from the enemy team. Be that as it may, it doesn't necessarily have to be power or lockdown, it just has to dramatically affect how a fight goes. Third, it remains useful even if the caster is behind. In other words, is it still something that warrants concern if used correctly? Obviously, Trindamir's ultimate is pretty stupid broken, but if he's got only two items while everyone has four, I don't think five more seconds will matter all that much in the grand scheme of things. Super ultimates have enough damage or pressure built into them that being down a full item won't make much of a difference in theory. It really comes down to perspective. I said in my Global Ultimates video that on-demand mobility across large distances is extremely powerful to the point where they can be considered super ultimates as well. 
I might see big damage as a super ultimate, you might see big defense or mobility as a super ultimate. With that in mind, here are some examples of champions with super ults to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Note that I'm intentionally refraining from listing any globals as I've already talked about them before. On my global ultimates, this is a lot more circumstantial and subjective, so I want to explain why I chose these 16. Fiddle's Curl Storm is a no-brainer. After a short channel, he blinks forward with a massive damage aura, up to 1625 base plus 225% ability power if you stand in it for all 5 seconds. Most of the time, it is rare to face tank the entire duration unless you're somehow immobilized for that long, but even at half the amount, you're still taking over 800 damage plus 110 AP ratio, and he can apply this to everyone. If he damages at least 3 for half the duration, we're looking at 2400 plus 330% ability power. You can't buy your way through this kind of damage. For crowd control and engage, Malphite's the obvious one. Unstoppable Force is a long-range uninterruptible dash that does a solid chunk of damage and knocks anyone in a decent radius for 1.5 seconds. It's arguably the best single engage tool in the game, and one of Silas's favorite ultimates to steal. Defensively, we have ultimates like Kinja's Lamb's Respite. At the press of a button, they're able to imbue their ground with death immunity for 4 seconds, preventing anyone, friend or foe, from taking any further damage below 10% of their max health. If timed correctly, this ability turns around fights better than any other. There are tons of variants for super ultimates in any given field. Also, you might be asking me why I included Seraphine's Encore or Renata's Hostile Takeover but didn't include Nami's Tidal Wave, Sona's Crescendo, or Yumi's Final Chapter. Seraphine's has far more potential range, while Renata's Slow Advance can actually be used to its advantage as a long-lasting zoning tool. But again, it's very circumstantial. Super ultimates have a wide combination of strengths and weaknesses. As mentioned before, most of them will be useful, either because they have infinite value properties such as crowd control or invincibility, or because they have so much godforsaken damage that chances are the enemy squishies would die whether you had an extra item or didn't. You've no doubt seen games where the losing team clutched out a 5v5 with a properly layered J4 and Rumble combo, or Hanser's beautiful 5 man nar ultimate. The amount of pressure dormant within these abilities means the enemy team has to always be aware of the fact that one wrong move spells certain death. One time I went up against a Kindred Tarek bot lane and they had the most broken combo I would ever see. Kindred would cast Slam's Respite while everyone dogpiled on each other, then Tarek would time his Cosmic Radiance to activate just as the death immunity wore off, ensuring that we were guaranteed to lose as they were immune to damage for another 2.5 seconds while our entire team had one foot in the grave. The existence of super ultimates in and of itself is a weapon you can exploit. Everyone's afraid of Malphite's ult because it's so fast, covers a large distance, and sets up his team for free combos, especially if there's a Yasuo. But by holding onto it, you can indirectly pressure your enemy team by making them think you're going to use it. And uh, I'm having an overwhelming urge to make an analogy to Smash Bros like I always do. By the way, hi everyone, if you made it this far, you officially know what it looked like. Sorta. The mask is covering my beautiful face, but at least now you know I'm Asian. Anyways, in Smash Bros, Cloud's Limit Gauge charges up over the course of a fight, and when fully charged, for up to 15 seconds he gains a huge boost in mobility and access to much more powerful single-use variants of his special attacks, Blade Beam, Climb Hazard, Cross Slash, and Finishing Touch. Any one of these can wipe his opponent off the face of the map. Most players are aware of this, and thus their playstyle becomes more scared, defensive, out of respect for his empowered abilities. But Cloud can use this fear to his advantage by pressuring his opponents into making a mistake without actually burning his limit. Same thing applies to super ults. The very threat of them being used can be exploited to gain control of the map. When you think about it, it's really hard to contest Dragon when there's a cannon standing in front of you waiting for you to walk up. You can't tell if he's bluffing or not, but that's not a risk you can afford to take. It's simply far too dangerous. In this way, you can compare them to globals. If you see Twisted Fate or Pantheon out of sight, you need to assume that they can be targeting any place on the map. At any point, they can turn a 1v1 into a 1v2 or a 3v3 into a 3v4. Super Ultimates achieve this more directly but more immediately in exchange. Another benefit to having them is that for the most part they're really good to have on any team composition. I'm pretty sure no one would complain about a Malphite on their team nor would anyone be too upset about Fiddlesticks. Many champions with Super Ults are also quite easy to play, thus being good choices for when you're autofill. You can spend most of the early game playing safe and waiting for teamfights. Then all you need to do is land a good ultimate a couple of times and there you go, job well done. Granted, they're not a win button. At the end of the day, super ultimates are abilities, therefore they're subjected to the same balance rules as any other. Since they have such impact in a fight, it eats up a lot of a champion's power budget, leaving much less available strength for the rest of their kit. Mind you, there are always exceptions. Some champions have super ultimates while still having very strong base kits like Nunu, Kale, and a certain swordsman wielding two blades who always finds a way into my videos. But typically, you can expect their basic abilities to be weaker in overall power than normal. 
To elaborate, let's go back to Malphite. Barring specific matchups, his Q, W, and E don't really do a whole lot. Seismic Shard is a single target skill shot that does damage and steals movement speed. A good tool in the laning phase, but it falls off in value unless you go AP Malphite. It's a pretty underwhelming ability all things considered. Thunderclap as well. It gives him a metric ton of bonus armor, but the attack itself is a temporary Titanic Hydra passive. Ground Slam is just damage and an attack speed cripple in an area. Relatively speaking, these abilities are all kind of vast. He doesn't have the same immense general durability as that of big tanks like Orin, Zack, or Scion, not unless you're up against the full AD enemy team. Also, what do most tanks have? Crowd Control. Malphite's base kit has none. Cripple is a valuable tool to have against AD carries and skirmishers, but really you're going to be counting on that ultimate to get the job done. What this means for the enemy team is that if you're certain Malphite, and by extension every other super ultimate champ has theirs on cooldown, you can breathe easy that the worst is over. Without unstoppable force, Malphite is half as threatening as other tanks. Fiddlesticks is way less of a problem than a Karthus or a Cassiopeia without his ultimate. Alawi and Kennen basically don't even exist without their ultimates. Moreover, the stronger a super ultimate's damage output and or the wider its coverage, the harder it is to usually get all of that damage. Take Rumble's Equalizer. It does a huge amount of damage and has a very long cast range, allowing him to follow up on his teammates engage even from a far distance but the line of rockets don't slow you for very much. Unless you have them bottled up in a choke point or have someone else locking them in place, getting them to sit in your ultimate for the entire duration is impossible. Same goes for Alawi's Leap of Faith. Provided the enemy team is quick to react and get the hell away from her as fast as possible, she doesn't really have an easy way to ensnare her targets in order to smack them over and over again. Nunu's Absolute Zero demands they channel for 3 seconds to get the full burst, and while there's a big slow within the radius, almost never do you see one get off the full burst without either getting interrupted or the enemy team getting out of range. That said, it's to ensure that there is some element of counterplay. It would be extremely unfair if Fiddlesticks instantly teleported with Crowstorm without that 1.5 second channel. These restrictions are put in place to make sure you don't just insta-win fights. Now comes the question, are super ultimates better or worse than regular ones? Like, are the trade-offs worth it for the benefits? I would actually say no. Champions with super ultimates may be able to solo carry teamfights with one good cast, but it means that's the only way they can really do so. Consistency is the number one metric used to determine how good a champion is. If you're only able to be dangerous every 60, 120, however long your cooldown is, that doesn't really bode well in the long term, and it shows. If you take a look at the list that was posted earlier, a lot of those champions have very low pick rates year-round. Conversely, champions with very strong basic abilities see constant play. In fact, I noticed the less dependent someone is on their ultimate, the more they get used. Not to say they don't need it at all, but if they can still execute strong combos regardless, then they're still a threat with or without. I'm not sure though, super ultimates are some of the most iconic abilities in the game. Malphite wouldn't be Malphite without his big ultimate, Fiddlesticks wouldn't be Fiddlesticks without Crowstorm. Fortunately, the latter was able to receive solid adjustments to his Q, W, and E while maintaining the strength of his ultimate. Even so, his combo pressure without it is a bit on the low side. Trying to design a champion with a super ultimate who still has a worthwhile combo pattern is rather tricky. They have to be functional enough to perform without it, of course, while not being too efficient. Main reason being, compared to globals, supers always pertain to combat, and if you were to give a champion a strong base kit on top of that, that's when you get Pike. His ultimate is to this day extremely powerful and one of the reasons he sees routine play, but they still hooked him up with a passive that regenerates a portion of lost health, a Q that's either a frontal stab or a long range hook, and an E that's both a dash and a stun, making him really strong and safe, hence why he was taken mid so often and why he had to get so many nerfs to his solo viability, such as his Q stab becoming single target and E dash not doing any damage to minions and his ultimate doing less splash damage. I think out of all of them, Nunu has the perfect balance. His ganking, clear speed, and combat pressure are quite strong, yet there's still a clear difference in power between a Nunu with this ultimate and a Nunu without. Unfortunately, there are far more badly designed champions. Malphite is one of the most degenerate champions up in top lane since he just Q-spams on you over and over until you're low, then all ends with ultimate. Same goes for Tarek on the other end of the map. Cosmic Radiance is so ridiculously strong in the right situations that it siphons almost all of his power budget, leaving barely anything for his Q, W, and E. That's why Starlight Touch and Dazzle feel so underwhelming to use most of the time. Essentially, Super Ultimates are extremely powerful abilities in a vacuum. Silas would be more than happy to make do with them on top of his own destructive arsenal, but in the context of a lot of the original owners, it makes for very lopsided champions. So I have a question for you guys, do you think a champion with a super ultimate should be allowed to have normal basic abilities, or is it a good thing that they don't? Let me know in the comments down below. We're gonna end things here for today, so if you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave a like and subscribe, consider following me on Twitter, joining my Discord server, and checking out my previous ability discussions if you haven't yet, but for now, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon in the next one.
Take care.